Welcome to Wave Basics. Much of this is going to be review, but we also need to make sure our foundations are strong so that we can move further and learn a little bit more about waves and energy that is transported by waves. Waves are actually disturbances that transport energy, not matter. And we can talk about wave, waves or pulses. A pulse is a single disturbance, whereas a wave is a repeating periodic disturbance. If you consider a slinky, look at the first diagram or the top diagram on your screen. If you imagine taking your hand and just sending it one pulse down the slinky or moving your hand one time, the pulse would travel through the slinky. However, if you moved your hand in a regular repeating motion over and over, you would create a wave or a regular periodic repeating periodic disturbance. There are two types of waves. We talk, we'll talk about electromagnetic EM waves and mechanical waves. The biggest difference in the two is particle motion and the fact that electromagnetic waves can travel through empty space, a vacuum, whereas mechanical must have a medium, cannot transfer through empty space. An example of an electromagnetic white light, excuse me, electromagnetic wave is visible light, and a mechanical wave is a sound wave. If you look at the two pictures at the bottom of the screen, I want you to look at these briefly and then we'll discuss this a little bit more later, but particle motion on a transverse wave is perpendicular to the direction of energy in this picture. And if you look to the right, particle motion, the vectors are drawn parallel to the direction of energy transport. That's real important to remember as we go through and discuss a little bit further, so keep, keep that in mind. Transverse waves, as we said, were electromagnetic waves, and particles move or vibrate perpendicular to particle motion. If you look at the animation, now keep in mind this is just a one directional motion animation, but if you look at one black dot, just focus on one dot, you'll notice that it is moving up and down. However, if you imagine for a minute the flashlight over to the left of your screen was turned on, the light would move to the right, or we would see the beam of light moving from the flashlight propagated to the right or horizontally, we could state for this diagram. However, the particle motion would be up and down or vertical. So the particle motion is at a right angle to or perpendicular to the direction of the energy propagation. It's a little easier to understand maybe if you look at the sketch just above the animation. You can see that the electromagnetic or transverse wave in this picture has both an electric field and a magnetic field that are moving at right angles to each other. So they would either be toward you or vertical, both of which would be perpendicular to the left to right direction of the wave motion, the wave energy movement. When we're actually drawing a transverse wave, there are many aspects of it, components that we need to consider, and as I said, some of this is going to be review. If you look at the top, you'll see wavelength labeled from one top of a crest to the next crest. And very frequently, you'll see a textbook definition as wavelength is crest to crest of a wave. Wavelength is symbolized with the letter, the Greek letter lambda, and that's that little upside down Y that you see next to wavelength. We can also measure it in other areas on the wave. If you look at the point labeled node, the node is drawn along the red sine curve that you see, you see, but it's also on that black horizontal line. And the horizontal line represents the equilibrium or the rest position for that wave. Because that is at the rest position, the node is an area of no disturbance and no vibration. As you move outward to the top of the crest or the depth of a trough, those areas are known as anti-nodes, kind of the opposite of a node, and instead of having no disruption or no displacement, there is maximum vibration or maximum displacement. Once again, focus on the node, and if you travel on the sine curve, the red line down through the trough and up over the next crest and then stop, just before you get to that vertical line labeled amplitude, starting and stopping at the equilibrium point, you will have also traversed or traveled one wavelength. 
because one wave consists of one crest and one trough, or in this we would have just traveled one trough and one crest. Be careful when viewing this picture, because if you look at amplitude, it looks like a rather long line from top to bottom. But hopefully you'll recall a vector is not going to point in two directions. So therefore that is actually two vectors. The amplitude is measured from the rest position to the top of the crest, or from the rest position to the bottom of the trough. So that line is actually two vectors, or a total of two amplitudes. Longitudinal waves, a little different than transverse waves, the particles are moving or vibrate parallel to the motion of the wave or the energy propagation. Once again, just looking at this on screen view, we have both particle motion and energy propagation in the same direction or parallel to each other. So the particle motion can be left or right and the energy in this depiction or animation is to the right. If you look at that animation on the far left, you'll see the red bar moving. So consider that is the source of this longitudinal wave. That vibration is going to cause other molecules to vibrate. As you did before with the transverse animation, focus on one black dot. If you just look at one dot, you'll see, pick any one, that it's moving back and forth, left and right, not really going anywhere. However, if you kind of take a different approach and look at the picture as a whole, it appears as though there's this stream of particles that are moving from left to right. You'll see little vertical, almost lines of particles that are moving. And these are the compressions and rarefactions we'll talk about shortly that enable that sound to travel through the molecules without actual molecules moving from one location to another. So we look at the aspects of a longitudinal wave, a little different than a transverse wave. We signify areas of compressions and rarefactions. Compressions are similar to crest, and those are those areas of the slinky where labeled, they're labeled A, C, and E, where all the little particles or pieces of wire that slinky are really tightly packed. So a compression is, think of what the word compression, to compress or to squeeze, and the particles are closely packed, and so those molecules that would be in that, or all of those, the metal of the slinky, would be under high pressure because they're all squeezed together. Conversely, the rarefaction, not refraction, not refraction, it actually is rarefaction, is an area where all the particles are kind of spread out. So B, D, and F on that same slinky, the pieces of the metal would be stretched or the particles would be stretched, and this would be representative of a trough on a transverse wave. Since the particles are all spread out, rather than the high pressure of the compression, the particles are under much lower pressure, so a low pressure region for the rarefaction. To measure a wavelength on a longitudinal wave, you would actually measure one compression and one rarefaction. So basically A and B would make up one wavelength, and C and D would make up another wavelength. The particle motion shown in the, the bottom drawing is more representative of the animation you saw on the prior slide and those vertical lines that you could see kind of moving to the right as you watch that video were those compressions and you can see it easily depicted here whereas the spaces in between those vertical lines that appeared to be moving even though the particles were just vibrating were the refractions or the regions of low pressure. Talking about sound, any of you that are in band or play musical instrument may be familiar with tuning forks and that's up in the top right. Well, we can go back to the slinky example that we've used before. Sound consists of longitudinal waves, mechanical waves, and most humans are able to hear from about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Now, that's a variation, and as we age, we tend to lose that higher frequency hearing. You may every now and then notice that if you've got a dog, he kind of tilts his head when he may hear a sound that you can't. Dogs can hear much higher frequencies as well. And some of you may have even downloaded one of those mosquito ringtones for your cell phone because you, being a teenager, can hear lower frequencies, I mean higher frequencies, I'm sorry, than your teachers and parents. So as we age, we lose the ability to hear some of those high frequency sounds. And so when you download those little mosquito ringtones, you can hear those sounds and 
I and possibly your parents cannot. Frequency is, we'll talk about it a little bit more in a couple slides, but frequency, you can think of it just how often, how often that sound is being reproduced. And as that becomes more rapid, as it increases, we hear a higher pitch. So we can't actually hear frequency or see frequency. We as humans hear the pitch, and we hear increases and decreases in pitch, and that should relate to increases or decreases in frequency. Sound versus noise. Sound is nice, regularly repeating, and noise is kind of all uh, jarbled. Maybe sound could be more pleasing to the ears, whereas noise is almost a little painful. When we're comparing the two side by side, or top to bottom, I should say, not side by side, it's good to look at and kind of see the relationships. So the very top diagram, that's a transverse wave, all in blue, and then a compressional wave with the red and blue. So it's not that one is turning into another, just watching them move side by side. And then the drawings right below, where you can see the compressions and refractions maybe a little bit more clearly than on some of the prior drawings. So take a moment and make sure you sketch both of these into your notebook to add with the other notes, because I know when I'm talking it takes some time, so I'll pause and give you a moment to make sure you have all of those details on your paper. When we talk about a speed, the speed of sound, a common misconception is that the speed is dependent upon the density of the medium. I've even read that in books sometimes. But realistically, we have to think sound travels through air, but if you have a soundproof room, maybe you've got a thinking of the band room or another room where you're trying to make music, you don't want everybody else to hear it next door, so you can have soundproof walls, and those walls are going to be much more dense than air, but yet sound cannot travel through. So realistically, what affects the speed of sound is the elasticity of the medium. And elasticity may sound a little bit odd, but basically think about how much the molecules can vibrate. Atoms and molecules that make up metals are tightly packed, but vibrate very, very easily. So sound travels very quickly through metal. If you look at the table at the bottom of the screen, the speed of sound through steel, for example, is 6,100 meters per second, whereas the average speed of sound in air is about 343 meters per second. It's a huge difference. That's why years and years and years ago, people would put their ears down on train tracks, listen for the, the train coming through the metal, the train track, because they could hear that long before they could hear the sound of the train coming through the air. Air, because it changes so much, affects the speed of sound in different ways. As the temperature, pressure, and humidity of air changes, so does the speed at which sound travels. On average, the speed of sound in air at zero degrees Celsius is 331.5 meters per second. And it changes by about six tenths, or 0.59, meters per second for every one degree change in temperature. So as the temperature increases, becomes warmer, the speed of sound increases. As the temperature decreases, it becomes cooler, the speed of sound decreases. Though sound travels quickly, it travels very slowly when compared to light. Light travels through space at 3 times 10 to the 8th, or 300 million meters per second, 186,000 miles per second. So when we compare that to the roughly 343 meters per second of the speed of sound in air, it seems like sound almost isn't moving. Speed of light decreases based on the refractive index of a medium. We won't get into that right now, we will a little later when we talk about refraction and Snell's Law, so don't worry about that so much, but generally speaking, speed decreases through mediums of increasing density. So vacuum, no density, no molecules, outer space, travels very, very fast, 
little slower, not much, but a little slower in air, a little slower in water, a little slower through glass, just kind of a general idea of what's going on. A little bit more with light or the electromagnetic spectrum. The sun is approximately 150 million kilometers from Earth, yet light from the sun reaches the Earth in about 8 minutes and 19 seconds. And light can travel from the Earth to the moon and back in about 2 and a half seconds. Various features that we have of all waves are frequency and period. Um, frequency, the number of vibrations per unit of time, and that unit of time is typically seconds. Just think of our SI unit of time. So if we're measuring frequency of a wave or frequency of any occurrence, we want to know how often that occurrence occurs in a second. It's measured in hertz, like the rent a car, and we can look at it as a hertz or in cycles per second, one over second. Period on the other time is the total time required to make one wave, to generate one wave or have one complete cycle, or for a wave to travel one wavelength. And it is measured in seconds. So you can see there's a relationship between their units. If you will consider the second hand on the wall clock at the bottom of your screen. So imagine the little red second hand is sweeping. How long does it take to sweep or to travel one cycle? Hopefully you said 60 seconds. So therefore, if it travels one cycle in 60 seconds, that would be the period or the time it takes it to return to its starting position. On the other hand, how many times does it complete that cycle in one second? Well, it's not zero, but it approaches that because it takes 60 seconds to sweep once. So it only completes 1 60th of a cycle in one second. So therefore its frequency would be 1 60th hertz or one cycle per 60 seconds. Now think of the relationship there. Period is 60 seconds. Frequency is 1 over 60 seconds. They're the inverse of each other. Really easy to transfer or move back and forth between. Now when we're calculating wave speed we're going to think back to that first equation we looked at at the beginning of the semester. Average speed is displacement over time or distance over time, depending on the scenario. Average velocity, displacement over time. But let's just talk about average speed for a moment, distance over time. Well, if we're looking at a wave, the distance of one wavelength that it would travel, or the distance would be one wavelength. So therefore, we replace distance with lambda, as we discussed earlier, the symbol for wavelength. And the time needed to travel one wavelength is period. So even though the equation looks very similar, it looks a little different, it's the same idea. So velocity or wave speed is calculated by dividing wavelength by period. And since, as we discussed just a minute ago, period and frequency are the inverse of each other, we can also say that wave speed is equal to wavelength times frequency. Waves are kind of governed by a few basic ideas, concepts. So keep in mind that speed is dictated by the medium and frequency is established by the source. So if there's an alarm sounding, that alarm is going to emit that sound at a set frequency. That's not going to change. But as the sound travels through air, through a wall that, it can, that the sound can transfer through, maybe through water, when the medium changes, the speed's going to change. So the frequency is determined by whatever is creating that sound or creating the wave, doesn't have to be a sound wave, and the speed will change, increase or decrease, depending upon the medium. The electromagnetic spectrum, we'll talk about a lot more a little, a little later in the, the week, but just want to go over a couple basics. If you look somewhat in the middle of this graphic, you'll see visible light. And you may remember red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or Roy G. Biv from elementary school when learning the colors of a rainbow. The visible light spectrum, if you look on the far left of the visible light area, red, and then into infrared, so infra, inferior, 
less than red, that's actually referring to the frequency. The frequency of infrared or microwaves, radio waves, as we're moving to the left, is less than the frequency of the waves created to the right. To the right of the visible spectrum, we reach blue and violet, and ultraviolet, ultra bigger, they're again referring to the frequency, a larger frequency than the blue of visible light. And so we get bigger frequencies, or higher is probably a better word, higher frequencies when we're moving from ultraviolet x-rays into gamma rays. Now if you look at the, kind of just below all of that diagram, you see the orange area with the red lines on it. Those red lines are representative of the wavelength. So on the far left, very, very low frequencies have very, very high wavelengths, very large wavelengths. On the far right, x-rays, gamma rays, the wavelength's getting shorter, 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 and the frequency's getting higher, higher, higher. I'd like to use an analogy of a Great Dane and a Chihuahua running side by side. They're moving at the same speed. Well, the Great Dane can just take one or two steps compared to 20 steps that that little Chihuahua has to take. So if the, both the Great Dane and the Chihuahua are going to move at the same speed, as do all the energy of the electromagnetic spectrum in a given medium, the Great Dane gets to take much fewer steps, much smaller frequency, because each of his steps, his wavelength is very large. The little Chihuahua, on the other hand, has a really short step, short wavelength, and the frequency of his steps have to increase, have to be much, much greater than that of the big Great Dane. So just think about energy. Energy is related to frequency. The higher frequency of the wave, the higher energy, or possibly the more dangerous the wave is. And if you look um, between microwaves and radio waves, you'll see a little gadget that looks like a cell phone of a few years ago, but that's where your cell phones fit in. A kind of an interesting fact is when we think about electromagnetic waves and sound waves, there are some variations, but we also combine them. And when we think of thunder and lightning, If there's a storm, you may hear thunder, you may see lightning, and the two will not reach you in the same amount of time. Thunder is the sound, the thunder clap, whereas lightning is the light traveling to you. So if you see or hear them what appears to be simultaneously, then you know that it's very, very close. Typically speaking, you will see the lightning, and then a little while later hear the thunder, and you probably remember from elementary or middle school, you can count and try to figure out exactly how far away the storm is, but also notice as you're counting if it's getting closer or longer, further apart than whether the storm is moving to or away from you. This also works with the crack of the bat. So if you're watching a baseball game, you will see the bat make contact to the ball at a different time than when you will hear that bat ball contact. Once again, Light travels to your eye much more quickly than sound travels to your ear, so you'll notice the bat ball contact before you hear the bat ball contact. Just to kind of sum up, um, an interesting aspect of electromagnetic waves is that, once again, as we said before, no medium is required. They can travel in outer space. Water waves need water to propagate. Sound waves cannot travel through a vacuum. They've got to have some type of medium. Sound can travel through gases, fluids, solids, and plasma. Also of interest is that the speed propagation, um, or the speed of a mechanical wave, depends upon the medium. Sound travels much faster through metals than air. To recap, speed of air depends upon that air pressure, temperature, and humidity. Different factors can affect it. Now, electromagnetic waves travel fastest in a vacuum. And the speed is the fastest, to our current knowledge, for the transfer of energy and motion. So nothing that we know of right now can travel faster than the speed of light. Just kind of pull all this together and think about it because we're going to go a little bit further with waves in the next few days. Thank you.